Anal An Analysis of the War on Drugs, 1989, by Brian John Griefson. Forward. The human body is an amazing creation. If you cut your hand under normal conditions, it will heal itself. If you abuse your mind and body by getting drunk, stoned, under normal conditions, nature will, will restore the natural equilibrium by bringing you down. Normality may be defined for our purpose as the state of consciousness which human evolution has found through trial and error to give an optimum chance for survival. The persistence abuse of any drug, including tobacco, will pose a long-term hazard to your health. Especially since the 60s, mood-altering drugs have become fashionable. This has posed a unique danger to both individuals and society. We cannot legislate drugs out of existence any more than we can undiscover the principles of atomic energy. We may and should strive for a drug-free culture. In the absence of that ideal, it is imperative that we understand and educate ourselves about the effect of recreational drugs and their potential for abuse. Such education must be logical and accurate. To date, our response has been hysterical and repressive. The escalating drug crisis and the resulting war on drugs is proof that our approach so far has been worse than inadequate. This essay does not concern itself with the medical effects of drugs. It is an analysis of the war on drugs. It attempts to answer how and why the war on drugs came about, what is going on behind the political rhetoric, and what we can do to promote a more humane and effective response to a serious social crisis. Brian John Griefson, Loon Lake, June 1, 1989. An Analysis of the War on Drugs First of all, the slogan is misleading. You can't find drugs or put drugs in jail. What we are really talking about is making war on people. Given the severity of the drug problem, this may be unavoidable, but at least we can stop being hypocritical. A certain degree of honesty is called for, if not of any intrinsic moral value, then at least for a very practical reason. We can't win this war if we continue to blind ourselves with bullshit. North America didn't seem to have a drug problem until after the First World War. It was during the swinging 20s that middle-class America flirted with marijuana. Before that, it had been used mostly by imported Mexican labor, and that hadn't been considered a problem. Drug education, consisting of scare propaganda such as reefer madness, one joint would turn a normal human being into a raving lunatic. Of course, sex education used similar tactics. Masturbation grew warts on the palms of your hands and eventually made you go blind. Why marijuana use peaked and then declined until it was a non-problem isn't clear. It's doubtful that it was because of educational scare tactics. After all, the American public didn't quit masturbating. Marijuana use gained new popularity in the 60s during the beatnik phenomena. Despite severe legal penalties, seven years in theory, six months in practice for possession of an ounce, marijuana use continued to grow. LSD was discovered in 1945, the same year which saw the explosion of the first atomic bomb. It took 20 years before LSD was introduced to the North American public. It came equipped with a revolutionary psychedelic philosophy expressed as flower power. Marijuana was also a mild psychedelic, and since there was an established black market distribution system in place, LSD was quickly available. The other major drug problems were heroin abuse and speed. Heroin was a serious problem, was associated with other criminal activities, but it remained a small subculture confined to major cities in Vancouver. It was basically separate and distinct from the much larger marijuana subculture and psychedelic movement. The rapid increase in marijuana users forced the courts to soften legal sentences. Anything else would have hopelessly clogged the judicial and penal systems. If the Government of Canada had followed the recommendations of the Lodane Commission and decriminalized marijuana, it could have dismantled the black market distribution system and at least retarded the growth of the more serious drug abuse of heroin and cocaine in the 80s. In any case, because of the sharp generation gap between users and non-users, such a step was politically unfeasible. 
At first, the psychedelic movement was highly idealistic and was associated with the civil rights movement, the ban the bomb, and the anti-war movement, and the search for spiritual enlightenment. However, by the mid-70s, the bloom began to fade from flower power. Much of this would have happened naturally as people gradually realized that there was no magic pill to cure either the world's problems or personal ones. Much of it, however, was caused by North America's incapability to adapt rapidly enough to changing social phenomena. If you call a man a criminal and you treat him like a criminal, don't be too surprised if he turns out to be a criminal. In other words, we created a self-fulfilling prophecy. It seems that we are incapable of learning from the disastrous experiment of the prohibition of alcohol. Prohibition did not prevent people from consuming alcohol. It led to widespread disrespect and flouting of the law. It financed the growth of organized crime and it encouraged the consumption of unsafe alternatives such as bathtub gin. As flower power faded, we saw an increase in the use of cocaine by the rich and powerful and a dramatic increase in the use of heroin in the city ghettos. Again, some of this would have happened naturally as a certain percentage of marijuana users experimented with harder drugs. Remember that the government had completely discredited itself over marijuana and turned drug education into a joke. A major factor was the Vietnam War. American soldiers went over there as pot-smoking college boys. They came back as junkies. The heroin they were using wasn't a 10% pure street cut, but 90% pure from the Golden Triangle. The continued prohibition of marijuana not only maintained the black market distribution system, it also encouraged those who engaged in drug trafficking purely for monetary rewards to switch to heroin and cocaine. Not only was it much easier to smuggle and hide, but it was also vastly more profitable. In the 60s, most of the marijuana consumed in North America came from Mexico. Although Acapulco Gold and Panama Red had a high reputation, the average THC content was around 4%. It sold in Canada for about $25 an ounce. The United States put political and economic pressure on the government of Mexico to eradicate their marijuana crop. Foreign aid had strings attached to it. It was changing the face of international politics. While the old war horses were still fighting their old political battles, i.e. capitalism versus communism, the hidden agenda behind politics in the Western Hemisphere became drugs. Ultimately, wars are fought over power. Money is power, and drugs are money. To a large extent, it was becoming a question of who had the most money, the government of the United States or the people of the United States. It's important to remember that although both sides were pouring money into Mexico, they were coming from opposite ends. Bribes from the U.S. government to the Mexican government filtered from the top down. Money from U.S. traffickers filtered from the bottom up. In the end, the U.S. government won because they were better organized in what in what will surely go down in history as a shameful episode, the U.S. government sprayed marijuana fields with a herbicide called Paraquat. They deliberately poisoned a crop that they knew was meant for human consumption. The U.S. government won the battle in Mexico and lost the war in Colombia. When Mexico became too hot, Colombia took up the slack. By genetic selection, the quality of the pot improved. Whereas the pot in the 60s averaged 4% THC content, the new Colombian gold or Santa Marta red averaged 7% THC content, and the domestic U.S. price rose from $25 per ounce to $50 per ounce. Meanwhile, an agricultural revolution was taking place. Japanese botanists provided the technology. Hawaii provided the climate. Not only were more potent strains of marijuana being developed by crossbreeding, our growers were also discovering the secret of sensimilla. By separating the male plants before pollination, the female plants could be encouraged to overproduce THC content. The new sensimilla took more care to grow, but it had a THC content of approximately 17%, at least four times as potent as the Mexican pot popular during the 60s. An added bonus was that Hawaii was already the 51st state. Theoretically, there was no longer any border to cross. Pot known as Maui Waui and Kona Gold became the choice of discriminating smokers. As the THC content went up, so did the price. The street price of Sensimilla in the 80s rose to $200 per ounce. 
about 10 times the price of pot in the 60s. By comparison, hashish had remained stable at $10 per gram, and the cost of heroin and cocaine actually decreased. As the government and its law enforcement agencies played catch-up and put heat on the Hawaiian connection, California became the major supplier of sensimila in North America. The climate wasn't as, as favorable as Hawaii, but California had the advantage of already being on the mainland. The Sensimila revolution had changed the name of the game. An acre of marijuana was rather conspicuous, thus the necessity of growing it overseas in a friendly country. A thousand dollar bribe to an American policeman only represented one or two weeks salary. The penalty was severe if he was caught. On the other hand, a thousand dollar bribe to a policeman in South America represented four months salary and if he was caught there was a good chance he could avoid prosecution by cutting his superior in on the take. With Sensimila, however, the same amount could be harvested from one tenth of an acre as from one acre a decade before. Furthermore, because it was ten times as profitable and because of technological advances in hydroponic farming with indoor lights and new pruning and cloning techniques, pot could now be grown indoors, cutting down the danger of accidental discovery. For the first time, it became economically feasible to grow pot commercially in North America. Would cocaine be the problem it is today if pot had been decriminalized in the 70s? It's doubtful. The Medellin cartel stands accused of supplying almost 80% of the cocaine consumed in North America. Although Colombia took up the slack in cultivation when the United States put pressure on Mexican pot, pot was not indigenous to Colombia and was grown almost exclusively for export to the United States. In fact, it was only the coastal region of the Caribbean that had been influenced by Negroid culture that had any prior experience with smoking cannabis. Most of Colombia, like Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia, consisted of mountainous regions dominated by Andean Indian culture. The only popular drug native to this region was the chewing of coca leaves. Chewing leaves is a difficult way to get high. One can chew all day with little more effect than taking a diet pill. It was the pharmaceutical companies of Europe that discovered cocaine in the late 19th century. As cocaine became popular amongst the upper classes in Europe and the deteriorating effects of cocaine abuse became apparent, more stringent controls were imposed on European manufacturers. As a result, result pharmaceutical laboratories were set up in South America. At first they supplied the legitimate medical demand, but it soon became apparent that only a small percentage of coca production could be used in this manner. As the U.S. put heat on the legal producers, clandestine laboratories sprung up in remote areas. It should be remembered that although coca leaves were indigenous to the Andes Mountains, cocaine was not. Virtually all the cocaine produced was for export to Europe and North America. Again, cocaine abuse would not, wouldn't be the problem it is today unless A, there was an existing black market, which there wasn't, or B, there is an existing black market distribution system, which there was, thanks to the Nixon-Reagan administrations. The popularity of cocaine and sensimila marijuana in the same decade is synchronistic to say the least. It's almost as if it's a sophisticated marketing board saw the writing on the wall and said, hey, how long is the United States going to keep sending us money for a product that can grow cheaper and better at home? Why not develop a product that the U.S. can't reproduce domestically, i.e. bulky coca leaves or refined cocaine? What better way to ensure that profits remain in the hands of the Colombian cartel? By the way, Colombia is not the major producer of cocaine. Bolivia is, followed by Peru. Why do the Colombians control the distribution rings? Colombia is geographically closer to the U.S., but there still isn't land access. Coke and pot still have to be shipped by plane or boat. Colombians are tough people, but not any tougher than Bolivians or Peruvians. Colombians control the cocaine market because the U.S. handed them the drug concession when they cracked down on marijuana cultivation in Mexico without decriminalizing it in the States. Canadians are estimated to have spent $10 million in 1988 purchasing illegal drugs. 
The U.S., with 10 times the population, must spend at least $100 billion a year purchasing illegal drugs. This makes it the largest cash-generating cash industry in North America. With such immense profits at stake, it's no wonder the drug barons show a sophistication today that would be inconceivable to Mexican farmers 20 years ago. This sophistication includes the almost wholesale corruption of the Florida banking system and substantial corruption of police and custom officials. Further evidence of their sophistication can be seen in the cocaine marketing techniques employed during the past five years. Despite continuous inflation, the price of cocaine on the streets of North America has gone down dramatically. Somewhere along the line, they decide there is more money to be made from selling cocaine at $100 a gram to a mass market than selling it at $200 a gram to a limited number of lawyers and business executives. Of equal importance was the discovery of crack, or freebase cocaine, in a form that can be easily smoked. Farmers grew the coca leaves in remote mountain plateaus. This bulky substance was then transported to the nearest villages, where it was refined in crude kitchens to paste or pasta. This paste was 10% cocaine. It couldn't be injected or snorted. It had to be smoked, producing a euphoric, amphetamine-like rush. This paste was then transported to clandestine but well-equipped laboratories near Santa Cruz, where it was refined into cocaine for export. This paste was unattainable in the U.S. because no smugglers were willing to smuggle ten times the quantity for one-tenth of the profit. However, a trend began to be discernible. Amongst Americans traveling in South America, where cocaine and paste were equally available, tourists actually preferred to smoke the paste. To draw a comparison, although nicotine is the addictive substance in tobacco, most people prefer to smoke their cigarettes than to go to the drugstore and buy nicotine tablets. The method of ingestion is at least as important to the high as the chemical itself. Snorting cocaine had serious side effects such as no ble nosebleeds and destruction of the nasal tissue. It was also relatively slow to reach the brain. Injecting cocaine was quicker and more euphoric, but not everyone wanted to stick needles in their arms. If some way could be found to smoke purified cocaine, it would open up a mass market that was previously untapped. Enter the discovery of crack or freebase cocaine in the mid-80s. Enter also the most severe drug crisis in the past 20 years. Where do we go from here? As explained in the first paragraph of this essay, we can't make war on drugs. We can't put drugs in jail. We make war on drug users. We put drug users and traffickers in jail. Presumably our goal is a drug-free culture. The 60s and the advocacy of psychedelics has gone forever. Very few people today would deny that abuse or overindulgence of any drug is detrimental to your health. But what do we consider a drug or drug user? We are waging a campaign against tobacco smoking because we claim tobacco smoke kills more people each year than any other drug. We are waging a campaign against drinking and driving because alcohol is responsible for more violent deaths per year than all other drugs combined. Has anybody actually studied what percentage of adult North Americans neither drink nor smoke nor use illegal substances nor abuse prescription drugs? I think we are talking about a relatively small percentage of the population. In 1984, 73% of Canadian adults aged 18 and over drank alcohol. They spent nearly $10 billion and raised government revenue by over $4 billion. 11.2% of the adult population of Ontario and an estimated 2 million Canadians use cannabis at least once during the year. Use of illicit drugs in the United States is still substan substantially higher than we find in Canada. For instance, among American high school seniors, about 40% use report the use of cannabis and 13% cocaine, compared to 30% and 6% respectively for Ontario students of a comparable age. How does President Reagan expect less than 10% of the population to win a war against 90% of the population? It seems to me the war on drugs movement is in danger of making the same mistake that Napoleon Hitler did. They are fighting on so many fronts at the same time, they have hopelessly outnumbered themselves. 
I suspect that the campaign against abuse of alcohol and tobacco will intensify in the next decade. I doubt very much, however, they will be declared illegal. However well-intentioned, such a policy would alienate a broad base of political support and be virtually impossible to enforce. Likewise, although legalizing marijuana, LSD, cocaine, and heroin would remove the tax-free profit motive, the ready accessibility of dangerous drugs to the public would likely encourage their abuse rather than stop it. Somewhere, I believe, a compromise is in order. Tobacco and alcohol should remain legally available, but drug education to combat their abuse should be intensified. For example, in the United U.S., there are an estimated 8 million marijuana users compared to 116 million alcohol users and a million cocaine users compared to 60 million tobacco users. Possession and cultivation of cannabis for personal use should be decriminalized. Outright legalization would provide taxes, but would also encourage its abuse and add to the problems we are already experiencing with alcohol and tobacco. On the other hand, decriminalization would prevent billions of dollars from leaving the country, free our police and courts to concentrate on combating the more serious problems of cocaine and heroin abuse, dismantle a black market system that can be used to distribute and introduce other drugs, and be a politically expedient step in recruiting marijuana users onto the government side in the war on drugs, instead of reinforcing the opposition. The importance of decriminalizing cannabis in order to free our resources to combat more serious forms of drug abuse can hardly be overemphasized. 1979, there were 482 admissions to federal penitentiaries for drug-related offenses, and another 820 admissions to provincial institutions. 1982, there were 64,000 drug-related criminal offenses. 45,720 Canadians were charged and there were 36,636 convictions. Statistics from the Alcohol and Drugs Addiction Research Foundation Statistical Research Program. Marijuana use peaked in the mid-70s. In 1987, 9.5% of Ontario adults used cannabis at least once during the past 12 months. This was a slight decrease from 11.2% in 1984, but overall the prevalence of cannabis use has remained stable since 1977. According to ARF researcher Judith Blackwell, Cannabis possession accounted for 11% of all federal adult charges, and the charges on laws on cannabis possession were estimated to cost as 60 to $100 million a year to enforce. Although penalties for cannabis possession have been liberalized compared to the 60s, the total number of people in prison for cannabis possession has risen sharply. For example, in 1967, 46% of those convicted went to jail compared to only 5% in 1981. However, only 200 people went to jail for this offense in 1967, compared to 1,800 people in 1981. When we speak of drug-related crimes increasing, we are speaking of cocaine and heroin, not marijuana. When we talk about gang-related murders, we are talking about cocaine and heroin, not marijuana. What problems do exist in this aspect would cease with decriminalization. When we talk about mugging and drug-related crimes to support habits, we are talking cocaine and heroin, not marijuana. When we talk about AIDS being spread by intravenous drug users, we are talking about cocaine and heroin, not marijuana. Yet in Canada, we are parroting the policies of the United States which have had one discernible effect in 1988. Cocaine is getting cheaper and cheaper and is flooding the market. Marijuana is becoming more and more expensive and harder to find. How does the drug trade affect the world economy? I don't have any idea. Economics seem complicated enough when all the factors are known. Will raising interest rates combat inflation? Some say yes, some say no. 
It's one thing for the RCMP to estimate that Canadians spend $10 billion a year on illegal substances. But what does this mean in terms of the value of our dollar? How does it affect our import-export ratio? If cannabis, for example, was decriminalized and home cultivation for personal use encouraged, would we save $5 billion a year? If we did, what would we spend it on? Would the extra cash in the economy fuel inflation? Hopefully, someone somewhere in this country is asking these questions and feeding relevant, relevant information into a computer. Hopefully, the federal government has a research committee advising the government on exactly th these issues. However, if they do, they are keeping it a secret from the general public. The same general public that's supposed to make informed decisions every four years when they vote on the economic policies of various political parties. While pointing out that anything I say in this respect is the crudest form of guesswork, I have to make certain suppositions. I suppose that cur currency leaving the country illegally is detrimentary to the country's economy. Ideally, ideally imports should be paid for with exports. It doesn't make sense to continue to send billions of dollars overseas for a product like cannabis, especially when some of the best pot in the world is grown in Canada hydroponically. There's another problem in that an industry larger than automobile manufacturing simply can't be ignored when computing economic forecasts. Unless the government includes an X factor, all their calculations will be widely off the mark. Obviously, that X factor can only be as accurate as their research is. Because it's a black market activity and the drug trade is injurious to Canada's economy. I also suppose that the drug trade would be injurious to the economy of the exporting nations. It's true that they benefit in one sense from an influx of capital. In the case of Bolivia and Colombia, I suspect the drug trade brings in more dollars than other, all other exports combined. Unfortunately, none of this is available to the respective governments in the form of taxation. It would also probably fuel inflation. If we accept the fact that drugs are presently the largest export of South America, then it's reasonable to expect that neighboring countries like Argentina, Brazil, and Venezuela would also be subject to inflationary pressures without the benefit of receiving large sums of higher hard currency. In North America, we talk of the third world debt. We talk of outstanding loans that countries can barely pay the interest on, the danger to the world banking system if they default. I question what part, of the, part the drug trade plays in this economic equation. When you read a newspaper or talk to people in the third world, you get a different story. We have problems at home with our budget deficits. However, it is nothing like the burden of debt they have saddled the third world with. They simply can't function without additional loans from the World Bank or IMF, and we insist they follow our economic policies in order to qualify for the loans. If we insist that Venezuela cut its food subsidies or social welfare programs to reduce their overall deficit, we are, are insisting a government rob its own poor in order to maintain high profits for our banking institutions. We, dis we destabilize the government when the people respond with food riots. Despite our well-intentioned foreign aid, there continues to be a net outflow of capital from the third world to the first. In other words, the rich countries are getting richer and the poor countries are getting poorer. In Colombia, the U.S. has created a civil war. The Medellin cartel has assassinated a former Minister of Justice who took pledges made to the states too literally. Government troops protected illegal airstrips from raids by bandits. What's going on in Colombia is quite largely a result of our own drug policies over the past 20 years. North America can't deny its own responsibilities for this situation. Does the drug trade affect politics in South America and the Caribbean? In the past year, grand juries in the USA have indicated, indicted the President of Panama and the Prime Minister of the Bahamas with accepting large bribes from smuggling rings. The US also produced an attempt to coup in Haiti, 
when the American ambassador convinced the president to fire some of his top military command commanders for involvement in cocaine smuggling. U.S. fugitive financier Robert Vesco is rumored to have convinced Fidel Castro to let smuggling rings use Cuban airspace. And these are not drug producing countries. They are only on the periphery. The third rule points out with some justification that it is particularly susceptible to particular political manipulation by the illegal drug industry. If the prohibition of drugs has produced corruption at home, the problem is even more severe in the third world, and they resent it. In the past month, the U.S. has seized airplanes from Air Canada, Air Jamaica, and Easter Airlines because drugs were found on board. They were held until multi-million dollar bonds were posted in expectations of fines. The Chief of Customs in Miami complains that corrupt airport security in Jamaica let someone load 4,000 pounds of marijuana on board an aircraft and claimed you could smell it 50 feet away. He failed to point out that a smuggler would hardly do this for the first time during a drug crackdown. Previous loads must have gotten through, which means there must have been collusion on the part of U.S. Customs officials. Third world countries are tired of taking the rap. While agreeing to cooperate in combating international drug traffic, they point out with justification that it's a question of supply and demand. If the demand wasn't there, the supply wouldn't be. Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the former Prime Minister of Canada, once remarked that it is easier to start a war than it is to finish one. The war on drugs has been going on ever since I can remember, but apparently it is heading for new heights of intensifications. The United States has recently adopted a policy of zero tolerance. For example, if a car entering the U.S. from Canada is found to have a roach or marijuana butt in the ashtray or a marijuana seed on the floor, U.S. Customs is allowed to seize the vehicle and resell it as an auction before charges, all charges can, can be heard in appeal court. Personally, I fail to see how impounding a car with one roach in the ashtray is going to significantly reduce the amounts of drugs consumed in the United States. The policy seems to have been adopted purely for propaganda value and in fueling an anti-drug hysteria. In fact, zero tolerance is suspiciously reminiscent of the final solution adopted by the Nazis in the Second World War. The Nazis passed laws allowing the seizure and disposal of industries and assets owned by Jews. The U.S. has passed laws allowing the seizure and disposal of assets of suspected tra traffickers prior to conviction or even charges being formally laid. They have adopted a TIP program, which encourages people to turn in their neighbors and guarantees the informant a cash reward and anonymity. A suspect can be brought to court, tried and convicted, without ever meeting his accuser. Presumably the cash reward is secondary and informants are acting out of a feeling of civic duty, not to get even with a neighbor who makes too much noise or to get rid of a potential rival for their lover's affections. Politicians in the states are already pointing out that in any other kind of war, the military would carry the battle to their enemy's home base. Forgive me for being paranoid, but I can see the clouds of war on the horizon. I suspect that we will see U.S. Marines in Bolivia, Colombia, and Jamaica before the end of the decade. Ironically, if the government convinces the public that a war on drugs is necessary, the result will be the same as all previous wars. The suspension of constitutional rights and liberties in the name of national security. Needless to say, the right of everyone will be affected, both drug users and the general public. The traditional lines of conflict are being redrawn. It is no longer a question of capitalism versus communism. It's become a conflict between the industrial developed nations and the third world. This has already been happening over the past 20 years. Nuclear weapons have made war between the U.S. and Soviet Union obsolete. Such a war is unthinkable and unwinnable. Instead, the U.S. fought the Viet in Vietnam while the USSR stayed out of it. Likewise, the USSR invaded Afghanistan while the U.S. stayed out of it. Is a war between North and South America possible? 
I'm afraid it's not only possible, but probable. If, as I suspect, the international drug trade is affecting the economies of South American countries by causing inflation, affecting the import-export balances of trade, and the ability of those countries to pay at least the interest on their massive foreign debts, then it is quite likely. A default in the world banking system will have severe economic repercussions. What do you do when somebody doesn't pay you the money that they owe you? Send somebody to collect? Zero tolerance is a policy of desperation. The people who advocate this concept recognize only too clearly that the prohibitionist measures of the last 20 years have not worked. Unless we are prepared to be satisfied with the status quo, there are really only two options. One is the legalization and some sort of regulation of drugs. The other is to intensify pro prohibitionist measures. The architects of zero tolerance have advocated an all-out war on drugs for the next 10 years in a last-ditch attempt to eliminate this problem that, rather than dealing with it through regulation. In order to win this war, they are willing to sacrifice some shared principles of law. For instance, the Thatcher government of England, which is ideologically in tune with the Reagan administration of the United States, seized an Air Canada jet which had arrived in Heathrow from Pakistan with close to a ton of hashish aboard. Air Canada was forced to post a heavy bond of several million dollars in expectation of, of a heavy fine before the jet was released. However, England's highest court ordered the bond return to Air Canada on the grounds that the fine of several million dollars contravened the basic principle of English law. Although ignorance of the law is no excuse in the sense of whether or not a particular action is illegal, a person can, or party cannot be convicted of a crime unless they are aware of the offense they were committing. To do so would be tantamount to publishing the innocent, punishing the innocent. Although U.S. justice is derived from English law, the United States has repeatedly broken international law by seizing vessels in international waters, disregarded their own and other sovereign laws during covert operations, and ignored their own constitution in the interests of national security. The policy of seizing vehicles at the borders upon discovery of a roach or seed contravenes, contravenes a basic principle of law that punishment should fit the crime. The policy of seizing assets of suspected drug traffickers unless they can prove they're illegally obtained and the legal charge of possession of purpose rather conspiracy charges both place the burden of proof upon the person charged and contravene the basic legal principle of innocent until proven guilty. Until recently, the RCMP in Canada had infamous writs of assistance which enabled them to enter any residence where they suspected a drug offense was taking place without a court order. This violated a basic principle of English law that the king's soldiers could not enter a man's home without a warrant. To their credit, the Canadian government repealed the writs of assistance. There are still statutes in place which allow an officer of the law to enter a dwelling place where they have reasonable grounds that an offense is being committed. This is necessary, for example, in the case of an ongoing assault or murder. To wait for a court order in such circumstances would be ludicrous and contrary to the interests of justice. However, in the case of ongoing and nonviolent crime, such as possession of drugs or trafficking in drugs, to enter without a warrant violates the legal principle that law enforcement agencies are responsible to the courts. In effect, in such cases, the law enforcement agency is usurping the power of the court. The courts are here to protect the civil rights of the accused as much as they are there to punish the guilty. In the final analysis, the courts are the only protection the public has from the abuse of police powers or the creation of a police state. Although laws are not written in stone and can and have to, have to be subject to change, our basic legal principles are protected by constitutions or charter of rights so the justice system cannot be perverted to serve temporary political considerations.
Interestingly enough, in Canada, a person is not protected by the Charter of Rights unless they have actually entered Canada. This means that all visitors to Canada or residents of Canada returning home are not protected by statutes concerning unreasonable search and seizure. For example, Customs is allowed to strip search anyone entering Canada on the basis they fit a certain profile or are in transit from a country where drug use is common without evidence of individual guilt. Although x-ray machines and drug sniffing dog teams are available, I wonder how many tourists are aware they can be stripped naked in a small room in front of two custom officers of the same sex and held in that position for 48 hours or until they can shit in a special toilet in front of said officers so that the officers can squeeze a plastic bag containing the fecies in search of condoms. The present prohibitionist policies can be likened to a drug given by a physician, the state, to a patient, society, for the illness of drug abuse. Although the drug administered has shown severe and undesirable side effects obvious to both parties, the physician has decided to increase the dosage. I'm very much afraid they are in danger of killing the patient. Intravenous drugs such as cocaine and heroin are being blamed for making the core of American cities unlivable. It's definitely true that hard drug use exacerbates the situation. There is increased crime such as mugging and housebreaking as addicts seek money to buy drugs. There is more family violence because addicts care more about their habits than their families. Finally, there is practically outright war as various factions battle over control of the lucrative drug trade. To a large extent, however, it's a question of which came first, the chicken or the egg. American cities were already unlivable before the recent cocaine epidemic. Overcrowding, unemployment, ghettoization of racial groups, and general decay of the city car as those with jobs move into the suburbs are problems which existed prior to and independent of the drug crisis. Unfortunately, drug use is a catalyst which compounds the seriousness of the situation. The worse living conditions are, the more residents are prone to drug abuse. The worse drug use becomes, the worse living conditions are. There is no intention here of exonerating drugs from blame, but there is no point blaming drugs slowly, solely in disregarding the social and economic problems which fuel drug abuse. A similar problem exists concerning the trafficking of drugs. Draconian sentences do not eliminate drug trafficking. As soon as one dealer is busted, another takes his place. In fact, drug trafficking holds more opportunity for advancement than any other career because of the rapid turnover of management. The fewer job opportunities available and the more the government reduces spending on social services, the more readily people will take the chance to get rich quick. Heavier sentences and more prisons do not provide a solution unless alternative economic opportunities are provided. We don't have to go to Nazi Germany for an example of how a government can mistreat a minority during war hysteria. During the Second World War, the Canadian government passed laws prohibiting Canadian-born Japanese from owning fishing boats on British Columbia's west coast. They then passed laws forcing these native-born Canadians to sell their businesses and homes in the coastal area and relocate them in work camps in the interior of BC. Since the government was in charge of selling their assets, they were sold at ridiculously low prices to patriotic Canadians looking for a bargain. Forty years later, the government has finally admitted it was a mistake and has offered token compensation to the survivors or their descendants. In pursuit of profit, Many corporations refuse to hire employees with drug or alcohol dependencies. While the government has urged employers to treat those workers with alcohol dependencies rather than fire them, there is no similar policy in place for those with drug dependencies. Recent advances in blood testing have made it more technologically feasible for employers to screen prospective employees for substance abuse. While this may be necessary for certain occupations, such as airplane, airline pilots. In the majority of cases, it is not only an invasion of privacy, it's illegal, for example, to ask a candidate's religion, but it is counterproductive from society's viewpoint. Our ultimate goal is supposed to be helping those with drug abuse problems 
reintegrate into themselves into mainstream society. Programs designed to identify and isolate drug users will only increase the burden on the public purse. Encourage participation in the black market economy and aggravate the ghettoization of racial subcultures. This was a concept whispered about in the 60s, but was dismissed as paranoia. In the 80s, President Bush has publicly announced that reopening closed military bases to serve as temporary prisons is an option he is considering. One of the most frightening aspects of the war on drugs is that there is little or no debate on the subject. Instead, we have one-sided propaganda offensive couched in terms which make a dem democratic discussion of the issues virtually impossible. What we are witnessing in the United States is a repeat of the McCarthyism of Hunt of the 1950s, only worse. During the McCarthy era, a witch hunt was conducted for leftist sympathizers. Politicians vied with each other in combating the Red Menace. Being accused of being soft on communism was the death knell for a politician. Any actor objecting to the tactics used by the rabid right wing found themselves on a secret blacklist and found it virtually impossible to get employment. How much more difficult is it for someone who, to object to the tactics of the war on drugs fanatics when to do so not only might make it difficult to find employment, but could also lead to charges of being a drug user and harassment leading to eventual imprisonment. North America has to come to terms with its drug problems in an honest and forthright manner. Prohibition simply doesn't work. We need creative solutions. Not all is doom and gloom. Most citizens of North America have more smarts than the government gives them credit for. Maybe severe legal pen penalties and military solutions can't prevent the spread of a drug whose time has come, yet society seems capable of absorbing the experience and coming to its own conclusions. For example, speed, speed Reach speed use reached epidemic proportions during the late 60s, yet it has virtually ceased to be a problem. LSD reached the height of its popularity during the 60s, but has declined since. Drug education is still often the school of hard knocks. This is an important reason for the decriminalization of cannabis. Those people who may still indulge in smoking a little pot, but have rejected the use of hard drugs like cocaine and heroin are the very people with the experience to become teachers. <laughs>